Hello, I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today, a production of the University of the District of Columbia. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today we'll be talking about the growing cost of college, the value of college, and whether or not society should encourage everyone to attend a four-year college or university. David Willisall is co-author of the book, Is College Worth It? David is the associate producer for Bill Bennett's Morning in America and is a graduate student in Greek and Latin at Catholic University. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, Steve. Well, pleasure to have you and thanks again for coming on. You bet. Uh, well, maybe if we could start with your book, uh, sure. since it just came out, yep. maybe if you wouldn't mind saying a word or two about it. Is, uh, the book is called Is College Worth It? Feel book, free to. The book is called uh, <laughs> Is College Worth It? Uh, it's available wherever fine books are sold. Uh, and uh, this book, uh, Bill Bennett, uh, former Secretary of Education, and I co-authored. Um, and it was written largely in response to a lot of stories that we were reading uh, in the newspaper. Uh, you can pick up the Washington Post or New York Times or Wall Street Journal and see a lot of these stories of uh, graduates uh, heavily indebted from, from their college experience and maybe they have a job or maybe they don't. Maybe if they have a job they're working at Starbucks or waiting tables, which is perfectly fine uh, as a job, but I don't think that that's, um, uh, they didn't go to college to get that particular job. So as we noticed these things, we wanted to write a book that wanted to address kind of the impact of, of this problem on the nation economically, but also how it impacts individuals in, in, uh, and how it, their decisions about higher ed are, are being shaped by this. And what is your, I mean, I've read the book, but maybe if you can share with our audience what you think the sure. main thesis would be. Sure, well, uh, our main thesis is that um, a college education, and specifically a, a four-year college education is what we're really talking about, uh, is not uh, the appropriate path for everyone. Uh, we're not saying don't go to college. We're saying go with your eyes open. Uh, you know, keep your head on a swivel. There's really a lot to evaluate. Uh, the decision is, is bigger than ever. Um, and I think that you know, we want to uh, make people aware of the certain factors that are going to make uh, uh, taking out debt and, and getting a college education uh, really worth it uh, for, for that particular student. Well, let's talk about the four-year college path. As, sure. as you know, when I'm not hosting the show, I'm an educational advisor, and I mm -hmm. help students with the college search process. How do we encourage, or how do we tell a family, or how do I tell a family, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, you know, I don't think college is appropriate for your son or daughter? Well, that's a, that's, that's a million-dollar question. Um, I think that there's a couple factors that if you're, if you're a student <clears throat> and you're thinking about college, there's a, a few important things. I think number one, you really have to make a candid assessment of, of your academic ability and your will to do schoolwork. You know, what is your motivation for going to college? Are you going because you want to be part of the party scene or, um, you know, just kind of hang around campus and things like that? Or are you saying, wait a minute, this is a serious step for me in which I'm getting this degree in order to either really learn something or get a a better economic opportunity or both. So I think that's one thing. Um, and in consideration of that, I think that um, you might have to explore paths that are uh, not the traditional paths according to what, what America currently says is the thing to do. Um, Peter Thiel, who, found, who was the principal investor in Facebook when it started and created PayPal, um, he says that going to a four-year college now for most American high school graduates is called the default activity. Uh, we don't think it should be called the default activity. I think people need to stop and examine uh, what, what exactly they're doing. Um, and I think that's also, as you've written in your book, that's definitely a family, family decision. You're right, and it is a family decision. But, but, how, but let's, if we can delve sure, into this a little please. bit more, because I think this is an interesting question. So we've got society, you know, the big Right. whatever the, the society sure, is, sure. says everybody should go to college. Right. And as a rule of thumb, more education is probably better than less education. That's right. But at what cost and who's making the decision? It seems to me that that's where the rubber meets the road here. Yeah, um, well, let me just say this. Um, I think there's another consideration in this uh, as someone, if someone says, okay, I think I'm college material. Well, there's another consideration. If you're gonna go and enroll in a, a four-year program, uh, I think around 50% of people who start a four-year BA never finish it. So you have a lot of people out there who are walking around with a lot of debt, um, but no degree to show for it, and no degree that hopefully will land them a better job uh, to make more money and pay the debt down. So if you go, you have to graduate. That's a big consideration. So if you don't see yourself really as an uh, academically motivated student, I think that you know, that's another opportunity for you to reconsider another 
educational path other than a bachelor's degree, which you know, I'll be happy to talk about in, in a minute. Um, I think also you have to look at what major uh, you're thinking about studying. I think I'm, you know, Bill, Bill Bennett and I, we both have graduate degrees in the liberal arts, okay? And I think there's an expectation there that uh, I'm not gonna be fabulously wealthy and have a, a beach house or anything like that. But I do put a certain value on that kind of knowledge and that kind of education, which is fine. However, if you're gonna pursue a liberal arts degree or a social science degree, maybe history, English, classics, journalism, psychology, communications, things like that, you have to be aware that those disciplines have less remunerative value um, than maybe engineering or IT or nursing or finance or accounting where a lot of employers are gonna put a higher premium on those kinds of skills. So I think those are two things in, in, that are important in considering you know, is a BA for me. But what are we supposed to do about an average high school student mm -hmm. who's not particularly technically minded sure. and who's not particularly serious about his studies? Mm -hmm. What do we do with that student? Yeah, I think, well, uh, a big thing that we talk about in the book is um, that the K-12 education system needs to get stronger uh, to kind of obviate the need for a lot of higher ed, to be honest with you. Uh, in Germany, uh, the system is designed such that it will produce graduates who can go into uh, a law firm or pharmaceutical company or uh, industrial firm or what have you and immediately contribute and, and get a good paycheck. Now, that's not going to happen overnight here, so it's not terribly uh, helpful advice. But I would say that um, it's also worth it to explore other options other than a four-year BA. I mean, community college, I think, is one thing that a lot of people have looked down upon traditionally. But there's a lot of value there. Um, in some states, community college graduates are starting to out-earn bachelor's degree graduates. So in Virginia, for instance, there's the Jefferson College of Health Sciences. Now, graduates of that uh, school, typically nurses, are out earning graduates of the University of Virginia, which is a four-year school and really one of the most prestigious schools in the country when it comes down to it. So I think community college is a, is a, is a great path for people who are saying, look, I want, I want the premium that, that a higher education, uh, uh, that accompanies higher education, but I don't necessarily need four years on campus reading Shakespeare. You know, I think that's, that's also an opportunity. And then vocational technical education too. Um, there's three million jobs currently in the country that are unfilled, and by that I mean with skilled jobs, uh, you know, welders, electricians, plumbers, things like that, where you can make a good middle class or better salary, uh, uh, and those jobs will never be outsourced. You know, elevators are always going to get stuck, toilets are always going to get clogged. Uh, you know, we can't, you know, call India to fix those kinds of problems. So I think that's another alternative is uh, that America should reconsider vocational technical education. Well, but let's look at the credential of those uh, students who come from a community college mm -hmm. or those uh, vocational programs versus a four-year de uh, degree sure. program. Sure. Do you think you would be the co-author of this book or on this show right now if you did not have a four-year degree? Um, not necessarily. I think you're probably right. It would, it would be less likely that I'd be sitting right here. But nonetheless, um, I think that one thing we, we've known, and there's a great book that, that um, is demonstrating this that came out last year by the writer Paul Tuff. It's called Why Children Succeed. I think this will help explain a lot of this. Character attributes are antecedent to um, how you look on a piece of paper, I think. Um, and we also profile a couple individuals in the book uh, who, who fall into that boat, too. Um, I'm friends with a girl who never went to college, but she runs a very successful wedding photography business and she was homeschooled, so didn't even go to a formal high school. But there's traits about her, uh, intelligence and uh, perseverance and, and social, uh, good social skills that, uh, that have really made her desirable uh, to her clients. So I think that especially uh, in, in light of how things are changing economically and people are starting to see that you, you don't, uh, there's, there's a lot more potential for innovation in the, in the marketplace as an individual these days. I think that when you consider that uh, character attributes and personal attributes are really more important ultimately than how you look on paper, uh, that should give some people some encouragement um, to, to say that a, a, a community college degree or anything less than a bachelor's degree, it's still possible to make it in America, but yeah, you, you will have to work hard. But then why do all the politicians say, well, we want to encourage more and more people to go to college? Yeah, good question. Um, well, I think that uh, that falls into the realm of politics, and it makes for a good soundbite, because 
I think a college education, completing a, a bachelor's degree or any kind of degree, that's a real uh, milestone uh, in someone's life. I mean, that's a signal indicator of being successful, you know, in our society. So um, if you're if you if you're a representative and you say, oh, you know, X amount of students from my state graduated from college within four years and it's a high percentage, well, it looks like you're doing something right. And I think uh, that's true. But I think there's also a simple truth that if you look at the numbers, and President Obama has has kind of pushed this a little bit. Um, if you look at the numbers, uh, if you the more higher education you have, generally, um, you have a, there's a, a better chance of you being employed and uh, more money you'll you'll make. So if you can be one of those people, I, I I heartily encourage that. But I would just say in in going to that goal, we have to consider that it's it's not as easy as just it sounds. And that's a fair point in terms of it not being that easy. But let's go to the issue of the debt that you raised and, and, sure. and, and the cost of that. There have been a string of secretaries of education, mm -hmm. including uh, your co-author, including Margaret Spellings, who have talked about the issue of accountability and containing costs. And it's even gotten to the point that even President Obama himself has, talked, has issued a challenge to uh, colleges in terms of college costs. Right. But if I'm not mistaken, college costs keep rising regardless of what presidents and secretaries of education are saying. That's true. Uh, there's a couple reasons that uh, college costs have increased so drastically. Um, well, they've gone up 1,100% since, since 1978, which is, you know, outpaces pretty much any other product in America. Um, well, for one thing, uh, colleges know that, uh, I, can't, I think they play on human psychology a little bit. So when somebody sees, you know, George Washington University, let's say for instance, their tuition is, you know, or the total cost is, is around $60,000 per year. So when people say that, they say, aha, GW is synonymous with quality because it's so expensive, just as we would look at, you know, a BMW or a Lexus being more expensive than a Honda Accord and say, there's more value there, it's a better product. So I think these colleges and universities like to raise their tuition kind of arbitrarily and capture more people who can pay full price and therefore use that money at, at their disposal to raise their profile, to get more applicants, to get more research dollars in the system. I think that's one thing. I think the other thing is uh, for the last uh, 50 years almost, we've had a pretty liberal policy um, in this country of um, government-sponsored financial aid, and by that I do mean federal student loans and grants. Um, well, colleges say, aha, here's a basically never-ending money spigot. We can always capture all this money from all these students with student loans, and we can always raise the price of our product up higher because really no politician has, has really been excited to come out and say we should cut off this, this money. Uh, so that's another reason. Uh, it's called the Bennett Hypothesis. Actually, Bill first noticed this in the 80s. And there's been a lot of scholarship done on this from academics who aren't even politically conservative. And they've, they've noticed that, uh, yeah, this is actually true. I think another thing is colleges um, in, the, in the race to compete for uh, more attractive applicants. And by that, I mean people who can pay more money to go there. Um, they've sunk a lot of money into things like uh, student amenities or you know, fancy dorms and rock climbing walls and hot tubs and stuff that really looks like a hotel if you go to a lot of these uh, schools. And that's wonderful for the students. And I mean, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I went to a private school and I, I think, uh, you know, I don't know how essential that was to my education, but it was a nice, you know, fringe benefit of, of going there. But I think in retrospect, I would have been happier paying less money to go and having less nice stuff. But you chose to go. I did. I did. Um, I think I, ch I did choose to go partly on uh, my own uh, and my family's own ability to pay. And of course, I did take a um, significant amount of student loans to go, uh, thinking that this would be a worthy investment for me. Um, I think there's also a retail benefit to four-year college in that you know, you're making connections. You're, uh, I mean, especially here in Washington, you're making connections with people that are ambitious and, and civically minded. I think that was something valuable. Um, there's jobs and internships here. That was one thing. Um, but I think also there, there's an experience at college of just the discovery of, of knowledge and discovery of knowledge in community uh, that's very attractive to people. And um, I think if, if people have that opportunity, they should go and take advantage of that. But that concern should absolutely be secondary to how much they're paying to go. Well, you know, in terms of the knowledge that you just referenced, mm -hmm. I mean, there was a good chunk of your book about uh, what, you know, what is knowledge, what are students studying mm -hmm. at university. Right. And that raises uh, a question in terms of 
okay, you're making the case that students should be, in your book, mm -hmm. you're making the case that students should be very careful about their majors. Yes. Okay, and I think that that's a fair point. Mm -hmm. but, but it begs the question of what happens for the student who doesn't really know. Uh, I think, again, uh, this would be a, uh, a thing to consider at the outset when you're considering college. I don't, I don't really know what I want to major in. Uh, if you have absolutely no idea, if you have no, I think, inclination toward study, intellectual inquiry at all, I think that should be a red flag and to say, wait a minute, let me put the brakes on, on this plan for college. Maybe let me work a year. Let me, uh, you know, go, go do a gap year abroad, travel or something like that if you're fortunate enough to do that. Maybe try community college for a year and see how things go there. But I think if you're in college and you're thinking about what do I major in, I mean, I think, again, you just have to look at yourself and think, okay, um, I might right now really value reading uh, the works of, of William Shakespeare. You know, I just get a huge kick out of that. And I'm even willing to indebt myself to some degree to do that. Well, that's, that's great, um, but I think 10 years down the line, what we see from a lot of people is saying, oh man, you know, I really wish I had studied chemical engineering or computer science, um, which are, I think, harder, to pre be perfectly honest with you. It's gonna take more of your time, uh, but you know, when you're getting ready to start a family, uh, when you're getting ready to get married, if you wanna buy a car or buy a home, uh, you might be disappointed in, in uh, the return on a liberal arts degree, which is not gonna generally be as much as some other degrees. Well, and speaking of the return, you've mentioned one of the big themes in your book was also ROI, the return right. on investment. And then you uh, alluded to, I believe once or twice in your book about pay scale and, and the return on investments by career and by major. Could you say a word or two about that? Yeah, so payscale.com is a really great website I would, I would encourage people to look at. Um, it compiles salary data from uh, people in working in diff all kinds of different professions and from different schools. There's over, I mean, I think 1,300 schools on there, uh, and they just released the newest one. And what it shows is, you know, uh, each school and what the average graduate of each school is earning after 30 years. Now, there's some, you know, there's some variables which have changed since people were graduating college in 1983, uh, but I think a lot of the schools that you see toward the top of those lists are schools that we still consider pretty good today. What was, what was interesting that we found was that a lot of the schools near the top of the list uh, were heavy on engineering. Uh, we're talking about Georgia Tech, we're talking about Stanford, we're talking about Harvey Mudd, University of Michigan, schools like that. So we see a kind of premium on uh, these STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math disciplines. Uh, we see a premium to studying those things in, in college. But then why on one hand is it fair to say, well, we want to encourage people to study what they love. Sure. Right, and, and, I, and I think that's important. We also want to encourage people to study the STEM fields. And we also want people to study the classics. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what about students who want to study sociology yeah. or psychology? Again, um, well, I think, and this, this kind of goes into a little bit of my, my personal perspective and bias on this, but I think a lot of these um, disciplines that have become more popular over time, um, these social science disciplines, I don't see uh, the same inherent value in these things as I do in the traditional liberal arts. Um, I think, you know, you can make, and you can make the case that sociology, anthropology, things like that, that there's a value in that of analysis of data and critical thinking and developing your writing skills, and that's fine. I don't think that you will get the same, uh, I don't think that there's the same rigor uh, as you would find with a classics degree, for instance, or history or English, because I think you'll find the same component in those disciplines, but then you're also getting at, at the human soul a little bit in those other disciplines. And I think that uh, sociology and anthropology and, and some other things like that, they kind of are, they're a little too uh, purely materialist and, and don't, don't get, at, get at the heart and the mind in the same way. But you mentioned the heart and the mind and you mentioned inherent value. Sure. And, and maybe we can delve into that just a, a little bit. So the inherent value, let's say a lot of people would say, well, it's inherently important for an American citizen to know American history. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think yeah. that there's some element of truth to that. We live in the United States, we ought to know something about American history. But somebody could also make the argument, well, you know, there are a lot of people in China, and why shouldn't we study Chinese history? Uh, the Polish philosopher, uh, Leszek Kolakowski, has a great quote. He says, in a culture in which your past is denied, you're alien to yourself. So I think that it's particularly important as Americans that we study America. I think it's important that we study the founding documents and American history. Um, if you look at 
the reports of test scores and things like that and just gen surveys of general knowledge, our worst subject is American history for graduates of high school. So I think that we need to recover that. Uh, I'm not opposed to studying you know, China or Africa or South America or anywhere else, but I don't think that, that those kinds of studies um, initially should come at the expense of uh, studying the traditional canon of, of Western civilization just so we can understand uh, how, how have we arrived at uh, the general philosophical and religious and political viewpoints that, that shape our world that even where we have differences, we still hold to, I think, general principles. As you know, that's a very controversial thing that you just said. A number of college presidents uh, would disagree with you about that. Sure. Um, yeah, and I would, I, would, I would disagree with them, and I don't, I don't uh, have a big problem with that. Uh, I just think that um, the more we are not uh, focused on, on what brings us together rather than drives us apart, I think that we're going to see uh, continual uh, you know, political discord. I think we, we can be in agreement that we're in an age of some, some grid, gridlock in Washington and elsewhere. I think we're in you know, an age of cultural gridlock. But I think that even if you take a different approach to a text, even if you say, I'm going to read Plato's Republic from a socialistic perspective, or I'm going to read it from a capitalist perspective, or from an evangelical Christian perspective, I still think that we can approach that text and say, look, this, the, some of the ideas in here, uh, we're standing on the shoulders of, of this giant right here as, as Americans today. This informed the way we live today. And I, we, I don't think you can say the same about you know, uh, Confucianism or, or things like that. Well, you mentioned Plato. I mean, if I remember the allegory of the cave correctly, yeah. um, it is possible, isn't it, that the way we're looking at the world right now isn't really the reality of the world. Right, and I think this is, this is the central mission of, of all education. You know, we're trying to, uh, we're tenu continually trying to arrive at a conclusion that we can call truth. Uh, and I think that those works help to illuminate that um, in, in ways that are more appropriate than, than others. But what happens if people don't agree with that truth? I, I'm not opposed to the, to the concepts of political philosophy, and in fact, mm -hmm. I like political philosophy. But some of my students argue, well, Steve, I'm not really interested in that. I want to study something else. And here you are positing, and other people mm -hmm. are positing, well, you know, it's important that students take X, Y, Z courses. Well, what do we do with that? I think uh, that's a good question. I think. Um, Again, you know, students should be free to study those things. Um, I wouldn't mind that they're offered in, in, uh, in courses, um, in classes in college. But I don't think that they, again, I just don't think that they should come to the exclusion of uh, th things that we have traditionally in the West said, these are the works that illuminate what human nature is and who, who human beings are and how we're intended to live. I think um, one of the things... Uh, Characteristic of the intellectual thought of our age, and this is certainly predominant on college campuses, is just this idea of postmodernism, and that we really can't know truth. And if we, if you do perceive something as truth, it's only a construction of your own mind, and you're 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 making up your own reality as it goes. Well, I don't, I don't think that's true, and I think that we have uh, we have um, works. We have the Bible. We have Homer. We have Virgil. We have Shakespeare. We have Thomas Aquinas. We have Charles Dickens. We have the founding documents of the American Republic. Um, we have speeches of Martin Luther King. You know, we have these things that, to us, you know, are 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 sort of our, our guideposts, our, our our guiding lights for realizing what is true and what is not. Why would why wouldn't you want to know what is true? You know, that's let me. Um, well, that think, would be my, my response back. Well, I think that's a fair point. But let's say, let's say we are looking at the American the documents from the founding of the United States. Sure. Couldn't it be so that other people look at it in different ways than, than we do? Of course. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's essential to, to the learning process and to the truth-seeking process is that, you know, there's going to be conflicting opinions, and so we're going to reason our way uh, uh, to, to a conclusion that we think is best. And if we can just open up, uh, you know, Plato's dialogues and see Socrates and his friends kind of doing this. I think that Socratic method of learning uh, is very important to, to preserve to preserve that, and regardless of, of what we're studying, um, and of course we can have differences on, on what it's saying. You know, I you know um, so. Fair enough. Well, yeah. speaking of Socratic dialogue, and this is a little bit of a dialogue back uh -huh. and forth. Actually, it's a lot of a dialogue yeah. back and forth. Uh, we only have a minute or so left. Um, what advice would you like to give 
to viewers who are saying, okay, well, this is interesting. I'm a little afraid of debt, mm -hmm. but I want to go to college anyway. What do I do? Um, I think, number one, you can be confident that there's other alternatives out there that will be appropriate for you and uh, can, can get you that, that type of education. Statistically, the odds are you can get a middle class job with that kind of education. I think that it, it is worth it to avoid debt. I wouldn't say uh, if you're going to, if you're thinking about college, I wouldn't say that taking out debt to go to a, a fancy private school is really an appropriate thing. I'd say look for value. Look at uh, a lot of state schools. Uh, understand that employers desire graduates with hard skills. Um, and I think that uh, use, uh, just, just, just be wise. Get counsel from a lot of different people. And uh, remember that even if you later on come to find out that you messed something up, uh, I mean, we live in a great country. It's not too late to change everything, but still use wisdom in, in this whole process. Fair enough. David, thank you. Thank you. If you would like additional information about David Willisall or Is College Worth It, please visit iscollegeworthitbook.com. David's Twitter handle is at David Willisall. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today. <laughs>